Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGange reporting for The Media Speaks. If you're watching live, that is this camera, uh, welcome. And uh, if you're watching it archived, you might want to go to The Media Speaks, which is that camera, because that's actually loading in high def. And I'd like to say right off the beginning, I want to thank uh, the Seacrest Motel for bringing you this show, and we'll get to that more in a moment. Sebastian Gorka, uh, Breitbart.com, excuse me. Sebastian Gorka, Christian Holocaust underway in Iraq, U.S. and world look on. Now, there's two things I want to mention here. First of all is this author is writing from the point of view that we need to go into Iraq and do something about this. That We don't share that. However... I would not be against getting any Christian that wanted to leave that nation out of it to any other nation that wanted the resident. Um, again, not real libertarian of me, but I, I, I'm libertarian enough that I don't want to go sending troops into Iraq and getting all these Christians slaughtered. But I, I'd be in favor of moving them. Second of all, the relevance. I've been doing the... Iraq, I mean, excuse me, the Islam-Israel handball thing all week, and I'm exhausted. I really am. It ranks right up there with homosexuality and abortion in an argument that never has an end. It comes down to this. Israel and Islam are either going to have to learn how to share that land, or one of those two bonehead sides are going to go ahead and blow up the land. And by that I do mean nuclear, whether it's a terrorist, a power plant, or Israel nuking someone. This matters because while all this is going on, you can say if you're on the Islamist side, hey, look what the Jews are doing, they're not letting food in, they're not letting water in, they're not allowing these rockets to hit their country without excessive force. Or you could be on the Jewish side and say, the Islamists, look at all the terrorists, look at all the forcing uh, of people to do things against their will, look at Sharia law. Okay, what are the Christians in Iraq doing? Nothing! They're bothering absolutely nobody, and they're, um, they're, there's a literal holocaust going on. Let's not forget that everyone remembers, as they should, the atrocities that Hitler did to the Jews. Everybody forgets that Stalin killed, I think it was more Christians, than Hitler did Jews in Russia. And a lot of that's, a lot of that, it's not, no, the Jewish Holocaust is all anyone knows, and I'm not saying it's not a travesty, I'm saying that this is also a travesty. When U.S. troops invaded Iraq in 2003, there were at least 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Over the last 10 years, significantly in the last few months with the emergence of ISIS, that figure has dropped to about 400,000. Why would you be a Christian staying there, for one thing? It makes you even, you know, well, I don't know how easy Iraq is to leave, but it's, it's very obvious that ISIS, which is now is, as in is stupid, is going to make this a... Uh, a real fascist pointed region to live in. It says, in a region where Christians predate Muslims, the Christians were there first. That doesn't mean I think they should give up the land. It just means I'm pointing out that the fact that they have a right to be here. In a region where Christians predate Muslims by centuries, that's hundreds of years for you Usher fans, over one million Christians have been killed or have had to flee because of jihadi persecution. While America is basically standing by and watching, this is the sad news that Breitbart's national security editor and one of the world's leading experts on asymmetric warfare, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, who has a terrible idea, brought to Breitbart News Saturday, hosted by Editor-in-Chief Alex Marlowe on Sirius XM Patriot Radio. And he's about to go yammering on here about how we need to go in and help the Christians. If we go in the fascists are immediately going to kill the Christians, okay? So that's not a good idea. That's a death sentence for them. But the facts that he's talking about, particularly the letter N, which we're going to get to, those can't be overlooked, which is why I'm covering the article here. So when he starts talking about 
America going to the rescue. I'm not in favor of it. I'm just quoting the man's words. Dr. Gorka explained that in the last 48 hours, I ISIS, which is now called the Islamic State in Mosul, has painted the letter N for Nazarene on the houses of all surviving Christians in the city. ISIS has basically given an ultimatum to all Christians left. You can either flee, convert to Muslim or Islam, or we will kill you. It's a religion of peace. And again, let's not forget that your average Islamist has lived in peace with these Christians forever. It's this fascist, Sharia, almost Nazi-like element that is in ISIS, that to some degree is found in Hamas. That is what frightens people. And again, on the Jewish side, uh, you should be frightened of Zionism. I'm not a Zionist. I think Zionism is very dangerous because it puts a target on there to prove a political point. But I digress. Gorka points out that over the last 20 years, America has stood up around the world to save Muslims, whether it is to save the Muslims in Bosnia or the Albanians, Kosovars, and Muslims in Serbia. It is now time for a humanitarian operation to save the remaining Christians in Iraq. Humanitarian, as in not the Army, Air Force, Marines, National Guard, or innocent churches over to help them. I hope they would help them leave. It doesn't seem like a real great place to stay. It is time for the American people and our representatives to do something for our co-religions remaining in the Middle East. Why would they be remaining in the Middle East is the question. Marlowe observed that the blatant religious cleansing is horrifying and asked Gorka, why is it that the mainstream press is not interested in this story? That's, that's a good question there. Gorka first responded by saying, let's face it, this is a Christian version of the Holocaust and nothing less. Very true. The Middle East expert went on to explain that the mainstream media is in full support of the White House narrative that the president single-handedly killed Osama bin Laden, and that al-Qaeda is now on the ropes. Therefore, jihad must be shriveling up around the world. This myopic strategy of only targeting al-Qaeda has provided great opportunities for other jihadists and have given rise to ISIS. It would be best to not be involved, and somehow he's missing that. On top of that, Gorka asserts the mainstream media are wrapped or warped in terms of their worldview. According to Breitbart's national security expert, the media is postmodernist, sophisticated, and secularist. That means a postmodern period, the modernist movement. Sophisticated, oh so intelligent, it's more intelligent than you, Buffy. And secularist, uh, you don't believe in any god or anything, you just believe that we all came from nothing happens every day. You get something from nothing. So when it comes to the idea of religious persecution, they say, we who really care because I don't believe in God, if you are not sophisticated enough to be a postmodern, a secularist, tough on you. Gorka didn't finish there with his scathing indictment of the mainstream media. I love this. He added that it is their racism that will let this genocide of Christians continue. To the mainstream media, Gorka charged, the dark-skinned person always has to be the victim. Either the Hamas terrorists in Gaza, the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan gangbangers coming across the border likened to juvenile political references. But the idea that the white-skinned Christian or the Israelis are victims, that goes against every narrative that this media wishes to peddle. They are necessarily so locked into their own ideological worldview. So what we have is him wanting us to interfere more, somehow missing the fact that George Bush went into Iraq to bring liberty there, and now we're having a mass slaughter of Christians, which hasn't been seen since Stalinist Russia. So no, going there isn't such a good idea, but I think it needs to be noted that there are other atrocities going on in the world, and the Christians there, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not harming anybody like the Zionists are. They're not harming anybody like the Islamic fascists are. They're just living there, being mistreated. And nobody cares. Friends, dailymail.co.uk, life after a nuclear war revealed it. Computer models reveal Earth would suffer a 20-year-long winter in worldwide famine. Now, before you say, oh, it would be much worse than that, it's more frightening. This is what they call small nuclear arms. 
Um, they used India and Pakistan, which are not anywhere near the firepower of England, uh, Russia, the U.S. So, what this is this is terrifying. We're gonna go ahead into this one. The terrible fate of Earth after a nuclear war has been mapped out using computer models for the first time. Worldwide famine, deadly frost, global ozone losses up to 50% or more would greet any inhabitants of the planet still remaining after a nuclear conflict. And the researchers hope that their study of what they call a relatively small nuclear war will serve as a deterrent against such weapons being used by any nation in the future, thank God. Um, scroll down here on my slow Time Warner internet. I heard Rupert Murdoch wants to buy Time Warner. It runs so bad now, I can't imagine what it would be like when he gets there. The unnerving consequences were laid out in a paper called Multicedal Global Cooling and Unprecedented Ozone Loss Following a Regional Nuclear Conflict. Because the results of a nuclear war just wasn't wordy enough. In it, the researchers looked out the outcome of a limited regional strike war between India and Pakistan, in which each side detonates 50 15 kiloton weapons. That is very small in nuclear weapons terms. They then used computer models to examine the impact of the planet and its environment, and it makes for grim reading, as you can imagine. The immediate result of 100 nuclear weapons, roughly the size of those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki being detonated, would be the release of 5 megatons of black carbon into the atmosphere. This carbon, not too dissimilar to soot, would block out the sun and can be fatal to humans. Following a spell of black carbon rain, think uh, black lung disease, a deadly weather front would devastate what remained of humanity following the nuclear war, and the temperature of Earth would begin to drop. After a year, the temperature would fall by 2 degrees Fahrenheit, while at 5 it would be down to 3 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than it is now. Um, it doesn't sound like much, but it, it affects the crops, is what they're saying. Accompanying what the researchers call the coldest average surface temperatures in the last 1,000 years would be a huge loss of ozone levels. They say that the global ozone losses of 20 to 50 percent would occur in populated areas. So there you'd be seeing massive cancers uh, just from the skin. Let's not forget the cesium, strontium, plutonium, uranium, and other elements that rain out of nuclear bombs, which they didn't even mention here and that consequently killed the, everybody that worked on The Conqueror, which was uh, John Wayne's last movie, which was filmed largely where the bombs had been tested. So it's, it's not child's play, friends. The drop in temperature could produce killing frost that would reduce most of the world, would, would reduce the world's growing season by 10 to 40 days. Meanwhile, the, so some things grow in 40 days. You lose the entire growing for the, all, all of it. Meanwhile, the eradication of up to half the ozone would increase X rays, UV rays, excuse me, in some locations by as much as 80%, raising the chance of developing skin cancer for large swaths of humanity. Combined with the global cooling, this would put a significant pressure on global food supplies and could trigger a nuclear famine. Five years after the conflict, Earth would see a 9% less rainfall accumulation. That means uh, what, what limited time you do have uh, to grow anything, you will find that you don't have any water to grow it with. 26 years after the war, there would be 4.5% 4 less rain. The result of all this would be the devastation and ultimately death of hundreds of millions, if not perhaps billions, of people. The researchers hope that their example of a relatively small nuclear war between two modestly armed nations, Indian and Pakistan, were encouraged superpowers such as the U.S. and Russia to discuss nuclear disarmament. Very good to hear. As we're talking about things that affect the Earth, we all know, if you listen to this show, that man-made global warming is a lie. Put a house beat behind it. ClimateDepot.com, Greenpeace co-founder, Dr. Patrick Moore, I fear a global cooling and rips Obama for hollow climate more. President Obama seems to say it is sufficient to say that the science is settled in his hollow statement with no content. How much more truth could you possibly get into one sentence, for one thing? 
Second of all, let's get into the deeper side of this because we know that Agenda 21 and this belief in this myth of global warming is all an excuse to tax us into obliteration and control most of where we go and how we get there. It says ecologist Dr. Patrick Moore, the co-founder of Greenpeace, warned, I fear global cooling during this keynote address to the 9th International Conference on Climate Change in Las Vegas on Tuesday. Moore, who left Greenpeace in 1986 because he felt that it had become too radical, is the author of Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, The Making of Sensible Environmentalist. Moore noted that a cooling would adversely impact agriculture and said, let's hope that a little warming as opposed to a little cooling happens. I would rather it got a little warmer. Ting, which is what's happening, not because of man, just due to regular cycles anyway. Moore noted that the U.S. has currently been cooling and noted that there has been no global warming in nearly 18 years. So when I say it has, I mean there was a period about, I want to say 15 years ago, but he says 18. We were seeing some play there, but that has not been happening, most studies say, for 15 years. He also mocked the notion that everything is due to global warming. If it warms two degrees, hopefully more in Canada in the north, maybe it would be a good thing if it did, Moore explained. Moore noted that carbon dioxide is a trace essential gas in the atmosphere and is not in control of the Earth climate. CO2 is the most important nutrient for all life on Earth. Repeat, it is not warming the planet and it's found in trace amounts. He's a doctor. There are so many climate variables that we can't control, and when you do an experiment, you have to control all of the variables except the one that you are studying if you want to get a clean result. There are even variables that we do not even understand and we cannot control, he said. So it is virtually impossible to think of doing an experiment where we would be able to tweeze out the impact of CO2 versus the hundreds of other variables at work, which is why you could never make a model that would predict the climate, he said. God bless him. Moore also took time to criticize Barack Obama. The president seems to say that it is sufficient to say that the science is settled. It is hollow statement with no content, and he warned that the education system was failing children when it comes to climate change science. Change the way our kids are being taught about this subject, because if we don't, there will be a whole generation of people who are just blindly following the climate hysteria. It isn't happening. Our children are taught, not taught logic, they are taught what the scientific method is, never. And they are taught that carbon dioxide is a pollution. They are told that it is carbon. They talk of carbon now as if it was soot. I love this guy. It says he is a pioneer environmentalist and activist co-founder of Greenpeace. Dr. Moore led some of Greenpeace's most famous direct action campaigns against whaling and sea hunts. So this is somebody that knows what he's talking about. It's just one more person letting you know that man-made global warming is not happening. It is, in fact, a lie. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. We do have a few more things to get to. But as I mentioned at the beginning, I'd like to invite you to go to the Seacrest Motel. You'll find it in Sandusky, right around the corner from Cedar Point. And while everybody else is spending 120 250 Halloween up to $600 to stay at the Hotel Breakers, which is a very nice hotel. I have stayed there. Go to the Seacrest. You're not going to be in your hotel anyway. You're going to be riding roller coasters. Go to the Seacrest. It's beautiful. It's a little motel. Bed. It doesn't have a, one of those shower things. You have a shower in it, but it's got a tub. Fresh, clean towels, nice bedding, TV, cable. Why would you spend more? Go to the Seacrest Motel. Now, you got to do me a favor. you got to say TCV sent you the correct views. Please do that and enjoy your stay. Look up the work of Mike McLaughlin, one of the best writers we have extant in the area. It's, uh, Facebook.com. Look up Mike McLaughlin. Tell him Sam from the correct views sent you and you want to check out some of his works. He posts them uh, free from time to time and sells other ones. Guys, PrisonPlanet.com. A woman says DHS forced her to strip naked at gunpoint during terrifying Dawn raid. PJ Dub on Prison Planet. Let me ask you something. How many of you said, Sam, you've already covered this? No. Just like I had multiple instances of anal and 
vaginal checks on women? This is not the same story that I covered prior. This is entirely different. It's another one that's happening again. Carrie Edwards said she and her boyfriend were forced to strip naked at gunpoint during a terrifying Department of Homeland Security dawn raid on their Florida home, which lasted two hours. Anybody ever read the Fourth Amendment? The incident began on June 10th at 6.16 a.m. when numerous armed SWAT team members, accompanied by a helicopter overhead, arrived in an armored vehicle at the couple's address before smashing in the door and deafening their pet cat with flashbang smoke grenades. Oh, who cares? It's just a cat, right? They busted in like I was a terrorist or something, Edward told the Tea Party News Network, adding, an officer demanded that I drop the towel I was covering my naked body with before snatching it off of me physically and throwing me to the ground. Having been previously employed by the federal agency herself, Edwards noted that some of the men were DHS agents, although when quizzed as to, how, as to who they were, and why they were conducting the raid, the men only responded by saying that they were police while calling Edward stupid and retarded and for asking the question. Oh yeah, everybody's just police. The Gestapo, they're just police. The SS, that's just police. While I lay naked, I was cuffed so tightly that I could not feel my hands for no reason at gunpoint, Edward said. Agents refused to cover me no matter how many times I asked. According to Edward's boyfriend, one of the agents then proceeded to oogle his naked girlfriend up and down like a piece of candy. Yeah, because if he was a terror, if she was a terrorist, which she wasn't, a sheet covering her would just be way too much to ask. According to Edward's boyfriends, I read that they spent about two hours trashing my house, even smashing clear glass shower doors and a vintage statue. Writes Edwards on her YouTube channel. How do you write something on a YouTube channel? My boyfriend, who is asthmatic, started having trouble breathing due to the lingering smoke created by the flashbang grenade. After thrashing her home for two hours, Edwards said that the SWAT team eventually handed her a warrant signed by Jonathan Goodman, a federal magistrate judge at the U.S. District Court of Southern District of Columbia, which authorized the agents to search for computers and electronics, although Edwards claims police seemed uninterested in the couple's electronics and did not seize any items despite raising the suspicion of child pornography. Now let's remember that they try they, they use child pornography now since everybody hates it as they should to 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 demonize anybody. They tried to say that Luke Rogowski was uh, uh Luke Rogowski was a pedophile because they were sending things to his email account trying to get him to open it. It's a common it's it's a way to make you not question it because if you question it, oh so you're sticking up for the pedophile. There was never a pedophile there. Surveillance camera footage of the incident shows armed agents surrounding the property. Edward says the clip in brief is brief because the agents ripped out her surveillance DVR while claiming that they couldn't be recorded. So let's remember the secret to that is to hide where your cameras are and to make sure that they're streaming onto a server. Edward summed up her experience by describing the incident as two hours of pure hell. The John Whitehead... John Whitehead, excuse me, of the Rutherford Institute, nearly cited, recently cited numerous examples of an out-of-control DHS. Friends, those of you that don't think it's happening here like it has in Rome, let's not remember, Rome killed Christ. Rome, those of you that don't think the book of Revelations is happening right now, those of you that don't think that the Constitution has been thrown into a, a wood chipper, there's something wrong with you. You're just trying not to hear. A little more lighthearted as we close out on the next two here. Uh, actually, three, but the next two. Some good news, entertainment news, from uh, Metal Hammer. Judas Priest reached top 20 in the UK. I mention this because I've been saying forever, the world is dying to get out of this usher. Chris Brown, Lady Gaga, The Weeknd. Drake, Beyonce, all these talentless people. People are dying for real music. And don't tell me that Nickelback is an alternative. It's just as bad. Well, here you go. Judas Priest have reached the UK top 20 with their 17th re studio release, Redeemer of Souls. Guess what? It tells stories on it. It tells true stories, fictional stories. 
something. It, it doesn't talk about booty or hoe or nigga or shorty or none of that. They just made an amazing CD. So I was very happy to see this because they're the number one rock album in the country in U.S. as I, as I sit here. And they are also the number sixth album in the country as I report. And Radio.com, as we go to the dumdy of the day, we got two dumdies. That's four. We have two dumdies. Gene Simmons, Radio.com, defends the 1%, claims half of Americans pay no taxes. He says, try being nice to rich people. First of all, while I have always liked Kiss, I do regret every penny that I ever gave Gene Simmons to make him the rich, arrogant prick that he is. A friend of mine wants me to go to the Kiss concert with him, the cover band. I might go uh, because I enjoy him, and I do enjoy their music, uh, but not like other people do. I'm not obsessed. I don't think Gene's all that great of a bassist, to tell you the truth. He's simply a good showman with a big head. Uh, listen to this idiot. Um, the idiot that uh, put Tommy Thayer and... Uh, oh, good Lord, help me. Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer, who I got to meet with Alice Cooper. He's a really nice guy put him on drug in the makeup of Peter and Ace, even though Peter and Ace are both alive, well, and drug free. Yeah, that's genius. Kiss frontman Gene Simmons presumably would have followed Romney's 2012 presidential campaign closely, given that he vocally supported the former candidate, but one major error committed by the Republican Party nominee may have slipped his radar because he just repeated it. In the interview with the San Diego, this is why I vote Libertarian usually, in an interview with the San Diego Union Tribune, Simmons defended his 1% er status, saying that without his ilk, there would be chaos. Oh, without people like Gene Simmons, whatever would we do? I have been part of the 1% for the past 30 years. It's fantastic, he said. The 1% pays 80% of all taxes. 50% of population of the U.S. pays no taxes. Boy, it's starting to stink in here. I think it's all the P.S. The 1% provides all the jobs for everybody else. Yeah, the 1% provides all the jobs. There's no small businesses opening up. Nobody's self-employed. There's no, uh, no, it's the 1%, 1% of the country is giving jobs to everybody else. Yeah, Gene. If the 1% didn't exist, there would be chaos and the American economy would drop dead. No, there would be a top 15, a top 20%. It would be spread more evenly over more people and more people would have jobs, you idiot. Try being nice to rich people. I don't remember the last poor person that gave me a job. That is the only true thing he said in the whole thing. But he's saying that the 1% is the same as the rich. That is not true. Where exactly did Simmons get the statistic that 50% of the population pays no income taxes? Maybe he took Romney's controversial statistic, controversial statistic that 47% of Americans pay no income tax, which, it's been estimated, in part cost him the election, as fact. But Simmons erroneously one-upped Romney, and then some, by saying that half of the nation pays no taxes at all. The Washington Post Glenn Kessler took it upon himself to fact check Simmons' statement and claims his understanding of how taxes work is flawed. Simmons may enjoy the 1% lifestyle, but he needs to get his facts straight, Kessler wrote. The top 1% certainly pays a large share of taxes and has a large share of income, but his claims are wildly off base, especially when talking about all taxes. For starters, Kessler explained that there are other kinds of taxes that Americans pay outside of income tax, such as payroll taxes, which go towards Social Security and Medicare and disproves Simmons' theory that the 1% pays 80% of all taxes. The top 1% actually pays about 26% of all federal taxes, according to the Tax Policy Center. A report from the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy pegs the figure at nearly 24% of state and local taxes are included. Even if you count only income taxes, it works out to 34% uh, there, Gene. Note that the top 1% pays 4% payroll taxes as the burden of those taxes fall more heavily on the lower and middle class. So, Gene, do me a favor. Please know that we're happy that you're at least not a raging liberal. That is good. Don't listen to conservatives. They make you sound even more stupid than you make yourself sound.
libertarianism. Last thing I want to get to, PrisonPlanet.com BizPack Review. It's where it's from. The dumdy of the day to be shared with Gene Simmons. So wrong. A man fights apartment management to fly a flag inside his own home. New managers at the California complex refuse to expl explain why a resident can't display the American flag in fly inside of his own apartment. Steve Roberts, whose dad served 25 years in the military, told the local ABC affiliate that the FDC management group will not renew his lease at the Oaks unless he removes old glory from inside his front window. What do you do? Why am I reporting on this? Why does it matter? Because you listening to this can call FDC management group, the what? The Oaks. And you can stick up for this man. That's what you can do. That's what the dumb D of the day is here is for. It's to point out stupidity and to get it stopped. The American flag, it means to me freedom, Robert told ABC 10 News. I didn't think I would have a problem. None of my neighbors have complained to me, and I asked the previous management for approval. You shouldn't have even done that. Robert said his lease restricts decorations, signs, or lettering outside the structure, but his flag is inside his living room window and can only be seen when he opens the blinds. The management company district manager told the leasing office that Roberts could only stay on a month-to-month -month basis until he took the flag down. Roberts told ABC News 10 that he refuses to do so, which he should. It's just wrong, he said. You can't tell someone what they can and cannot have displayed inside their own place. And it's an American flag in America. God bless him. Dumb the other day. Again, it's FDC management group. The place is called The Oaks. You are listening to The Correct Views, Sam I. 